using it against me or against CNN or against anybody else that you deem to be unworthy of your approval. Well done, sir. Go with the masters of the universe. Go with your people. Go to, go to your people. Am, Those I'm are your people. I'm looking forward to seeing how you edit this. It'll be raw, my friend. Uncut. Excellent. In which case, you will fully understand it's not particularly pleasant at half past nine in the morning to be ambushed by one, two, three, four, five people. Five. I don't even deploy that many people when I'm going to interview a president. You've got that many people in the makeup room alone. That was the funnest interview we've done so far. But of these hundreds of journalists, 99% of them are what I call regime Journalist Richard Quest asked me to repeat that three times. He'd never heard it before. I don't think he liked it. What I mean by that, though, is that they have to pay to play. They have to buy their way in. It's one of the ways that Klaus Schwab has gotten so rich. But there are a handful of citizen journalists on the outside, literally on the outside, as well as metaphorically. And one of my favorites is my friend Andrew Lawton of True North. And I think this is your third time here at Davos. Is that right? Yes, it is my third. Uh, the second without accreditation. I had no papers the first time. I uh, snuck in apparently on the second time, but they didn't like my coverage. So no accreditation this time back out on the streets. Well, isn't that interesting? Was there anything in particular that you did that you think got them to nix your VIP status? To be honest, no. And, and I probably could have been and should have been a lot more aggressive, uh, knowing it was going to be my one and only time. I, I did go up to world leaders and, and ask polite and firm questions, but no one ever complained. And uh, one of the WEF staffers who I had uh, corresponded with, uh, he and I chatted in quite a friendly way when I bumped into him. So uh, nothing happened uh, from a behavioral perspective. But I, I think the WEF actually likes the conspiracy theories. They don't like the reasoned critiques. They don't like the policy-oriented critiques because those ones they can't just dismiss as conspiracy theories. Isn't that interesting? Um, now, were there certain things... Um, the, uh, tell me some of the things you could do from the inside that maybe you couldn't do from the outside, but I also understand that there may have been some limits. For example, there were some rooms or mm -hmm. hallways where there was no interviews allowed. What were the ground rules on the inside? So you actually couldn't do all that much, which is why I still thought it was worth coming back because the main hub of everything that's on the other side of those security gates is called the Davos Congress Center. And that's the room where when you see the videos of the speeches, most of them are in that building. You can't go in there with a press badge unless you're on an approved list. And even to get on that list, you have to ask for permission in advance. They time it. And if you scan your badge outside of that 30 minutes, uh, which is what they gave me at one point when I, I said I wanted to attend a particular speech, it will just be deactivated and you're sent back. So really all it got you was access to the media filing room, which was, you know, a nice warm place where you could sit and do some work and uh, access to a few press conferences. But those things were not really with the heavy hitters that you find out on the streets here. So really, I think you have better access with no strings on the street to do real journalism than you do on the inside. Well, you have a bit of a different style than we do, and I admire it, and, and it's successful uh, in a way that we're not, and, and we're successful in other ways too. Um, can you tell me your favorite interview that you've done so far? It, maybe it was for the substance of it. Maybe you enjoyed the personality of the person. Maybe, what was your favorite moment so far this week? So I, my interview style, some people say I, I am too soft with it, but my approach is that I want answers. I'm not trying to persuade the person. I'm not trying to argue or debate with them. I, I want answers. You want to actually pull something out of their yeah. mouth. Yeah, and, and, and sometimes I, I think that, and pardon using a violent metaphor, which may get me strung up on some you know online charge or whatever, but I, I think that a lot of these people, if you let them speak, they tie the rope around their own necks, metaphorically speaking. And by that, I mean that these people are very transparent when they get talking about what it is that they want to do. And they I let actually, their hair down a bit. Yeah, and I actually want the public to see what that agenda is. So, mm -hmm. I mean, one example, I, I spoke to Australia's e-safety commissioner, oh, yeah. uh, Julian Mangrant. Now, you may remember a couple of years ago, she talked about the need to recalibrate free speech. Speech. And I just asked her what she meant by that. And she gave a remarkably candid answer about all the things that she thinks need to be done to stop free speech online. I know I'm not going to persuade her, but I think that's an incredibly revealing interview that people ought to be aware of. Julie Andrew Lawton with True North in Canada. I'm just one wondering when you talked about recalibrating free speech a couple of years ago, what were you referring to? I am talking about balancing a range of rights that everyone has a right to online. Where do you think freedom of expression online should be limited? When it 
undermines other people's freedom of expression and causes significant harm. But that's all I have to say. But that's a subjective term. Like who's to adjudicate what harm is? Is it governments? Well, actually, it is a, the government drew the line on what the threshold was, and an investigation is um, taken when somebody reports to a platform when it doesn't conform to their terms of service. They come to us to adjudicate. Do you believe that the First Amendment has too high a bar for the online era? The First Amendment does not apply in Australia. I know, but you're an American, so I thought in general, as, as a standard for freedom of expression, do you think that's too high of one? No, I don't, I don't apply that. I apply my, the laws of the Australian government that the parliamentarians um, provided and the thresholds they provided, and it's measured against those thresholds. You're right, and of course, if you pull things out of their mouths, you can comment about it later on your own time because you have precious few seconds or minutes with uh, them. I, I have an approach when they stonewall, which is I sometimes I keep asking questions just to put them on the record and just to sort of demonstrate that they're avoiding answering. What do you think of that approach? Uh, no, absolutely. You know, this year, I, I'll say, I mean, the Julie Inman Grant one stands out in part because so few people have been willing to talk to me this year. I've had far more instances where I'm putting questions to people that go unanswered. But, you know, I used to, when I was starting out in media, get a little dejected about that. But now I, I think, you know what, a non-answer is an answer of its own kind. Mm -hmm.